Hi there, I am Professor Blackmore, and I want to welcome you to ProfessorBlackmore.com, where our goal is to empower results through real productivity. And if you haven't visited my channel before, i like to ask that you please subscribe and click the bell so you'll be notified whenever I post new videos. And please also follow me on TikTok and Instagram. And today, I want to talk to you about the unfortunate recent murder of California UCLA grad student Brianna Kupfer in Los Angeles, California and the really senseless wild wild west lawlessness that's playing out all across the United States that is occurring as a result of the dismantling of our criminal justice system. And I'm not going to go into a long drawn out sermon about the three necessary components of the criminal justice system, which are one, the police, two, the courts, which includes judges and prosecutors that act in the interest of justice and public safety and defense attorneys who can worry about the constitutional rights of the accused. And then the third necessary component of the criminal justice system, which is corrections, which includes our system of consequences for crime. The corrections component is divided into institutional corrections, i.e. our prison system and community corrections, which includes our parole and probation systems. And I talk about these three components of the criminal justice system in greater detail in my video blogcast, which details the now very necessary steps to obtain a concealed carry weapon permit in Los Angeles. And I'll place the link in the description section of this video. And so this leads into my question for today, which is in addition to the Los Angeles County's soft on crime DA Gascon, who else in the criminal justice system is also responsible for this unfortunate murder of Brianna Kupfer? Now, by way of brief background, you may be aware of the recent murder of UCLA grad student Brianna Kupfer while she was working in a furniture store in Los Angeles, California. She was working alone in the store when a savage individual walked into the store, stabbed her to death, and just walked out of the back door as if nothing ever happened. And so when I asked the question, who else in the criminal justice system is responsible for the murder of Brianna Kupfer? I am 100% clear that this savage murderer is 100% responsible for her death. But I want to focus on the people inside of the criminal justice system who could have stopped this unfortunate death from occurring. And I want to focus on the second component of the criminal justice system that I spoke to you about earlier, which is the criminal courts. And I want to focus on this component because a lot of failures occurred that could have prevented the murder of Brianna Kupfer had these failures not occurred. Now, media reports indicate that the murderer of Brianna Kupfer had a rap sheet spanning the entire country. It appears that he began his criminal career in 2010 in Charleston, South Carolina. He's committed crimes in Charlotte, North Carolina, San Mateo, California, Covina, California, and now the unfortunate murder of Brianna Kupfer in Los Angeles, California. And it seems that in all of these cases, he was either released on a bail bond or no requirement to post bail at all. So I want to focus on this finite part of the second component of the criminal justice system, which includes the criminal courts. And in doing so, I want to correct what seems to be a misconception reported by the news media leading the public to think that the prosecutor is in charge of bail. That's just not true. Bail is a privilege that is afforded to a criminal defendant if he or she is eligible to receive it. That decision is fully within the purview of the elected judge who is hopefully acting in the interest of justice but equally as important 
in the interest of public safety of the citizens. You would hope that the elected prosecutor or district attorney will request bail that is high or low enough to ensure justice or, more importantly, to request that the court not afford bail at all if the public safety of the citizens is in jeopardy. And at this point in time, in many cities in this country, and most definitely in Los Angeles, this is not present. You will hear me say over and over, notwithstanding my over 20 years of civil and criminal defense work, that you just cannot play patty cake with criminals. And that is what you have in Los Angeles County. You have a soft on crime, bail reform advocate prosecutor in George Gascon who will never request that no bail be afforded to the defendant at all or that the court set bail high enough to prevent violent offenders from being released into the community. That is, until someone is murdered and the murder causes a public outcry that is too loud for him to do what he normally would do, which is zero dollars bail or the lowest amount of bail at all. But this failure does not just stop at the prosecutor or the DA. The recommendation of the prosecutor or the DA on the availability of bail at all or the amount of bail is just one component that goes into the judge's decision. But the decision is ultimately that of the judge and within the judge's discretion. So let's look at how bail works. First of all, be clear. Before a judge makes a ruling on the issue of bail, he's going to see without a doubt this 12-year crime spree rap sheet, which should say right off the bat that this person is just not eligible for bail whatsoever. And you don't even have to look at the entire rap sheet. You can go straight to the November 13, 2019 arrest in Charlotte, South Carolina, when he discharged a firearm into an occupied vehicle. The judge said bail at $50,000. So let's examine this a little bit closer. Based on this lengthy rap sheet, including allegations of previous bail jumping, which indicates in and of itself that he's not eligible for bail, the prosecutor in that particular South Carolina firearms case should have requested that the judge not afford bail to this defendant at all. And even if the prosecutor requested a high enough bail, the judge still has discretion in the interest of public safety to deny bail to the offender. In addition, the judge can impose other terms in the interest of public safety, such as requiring a high enough bail amount and requiring the defendant pay the bail in all cash. In other words, denying the defendant the opportunity to be able to post that bail with the assistance of a bail bond. And I'll talk about that just a little bit later. Now, if you've been following my channel, you'll remember my case closed video broadcast on the case of the high schooler, Ethan Crumbly, who brought a gun to school and killed and injured numerous individuals at the school. In that case, in numerous press conferences, the prosecutor blamed the parents, causing them to have to go into hiding, fearing for their lives but they were in close contact with their attorneys at the time. The prosecutor refused to return the phone calls of the parents' attorneys and failed to advise them that the court had set the arraignment of the parents to take place later that day. This resulted in a fugitive warrant manhunt for the parents. Now, I hope you'll review my video on that case because although the parents were incredibly stupid, I do not believe the prosecutor will be able to get convictions in that case if the jury follows the law. The judge in that case ended up setting bail against both of the parents in the amount of $500,000 each. And it had to be posted all in cash. So they have no ability to be able to post that bail with the assistance of a bail's bondsman. So we have two parents who did not actually commit the murders in one case. Two parents who may have nothing more than a DWI in their criminal history, who have to come up with a million dollars cash before they can be released. Two people who, again, were, in my opinion, incredibly stupid when it came to parenting, but they were employed individuals 
who are not in any way, shape, form of fashion a threat to public safety, who, again, are innocent until proven guilty on the charges that, again, I do not believe will end in a guilty verdict. But then in this case, we have a career criminal who has been granted bail in the 2019 case in Charlotte, South Carolina, in the amount of $50,000 with the ability to be able to post it in the form of a bail bond, allowing someone to pay $5,000 to the bail bondsman, and he's out on the streets free to make his way to a furniture store in Los Angeles. But before he gets there, he's able to stop along the way in October of 2020, wherein he's arrested again, wash, rinse, and repeat, notwithstanding the fact that he's violated the terms of the $50,000 bail bond, George Gascon and a Los Angeles County judge allow this public safety hazard to be out in the community on $1,000 bail when he was not eligible for bail at all. So this is how bail works. When this violent offender was arrested in October 2020 on what the record shows to be a misdemeanor charge, it should have been argued by the prosecutor that he's not eligible for bail at all. But irrespective of that, it is the job of the judge to determine if the person is even eligible for bail. In other words, if the person is a threat to public safety, if he is a flight risk, etc. And so the court's pretrial services and probation division will run the criminal history so the judge will have known full well that there was an open case from the 2019 South Carolina incident. And even if, and especially if, that judge in that case had revoked the $50,000 bail, it would have triggered a bench warrant and or a warrant issued to the bail bondsman to bring the offender back in. And the judge should have seen this warrant and any other outstanding warrants which should have rendered him ineligible to be considered for bail at all. And the judge should have denied bail. Now, this is a good time for me to distinguish what I mean when I say not eligible for bail, as opposed to what has been known as a no cash bail system that many soft on crime prosecutors like George Gascon are trying to implement. Now, what you have is your soft on crime DAs trying to implement a no cash bail system in a place like Los Angeles, where the voters have loudly spoken on the issue and stated that they don't want a no cash bail system. And so the DA or prosecutor will institute a policy wherein their office will go to the court at the time of the arraignment and they will recommend zero dollars in bail, which is zero or no cash, trying to go around the system that the voters have voted for and create an internal no cash bail system within their office. But the judge still has discretion and, in my opinion, the duty to determine whether that person is eligible for bail in the interest of public safety. Now, a bail bond is an insurance surety or guarantee. It's like an insurance policy written to the court that allows the defendant to remain out of jail until the criminal court proceeding is concluded. The defendant is released and the bail bondsman becomes liable to the court for the $10,000 or in our case, the $50,000 bail example in South Carolina. The defendant pays 10% of that amount, $1,000 or in our case, $5,000, a $5,000 non-refundable bond premium to the bail bondsman. So that is the money that the bail bondsman makes on the deal and it is non-refundable. The bail bondsman will make sure that the defendant is not a flight risk, at least they are supposed to, and they will find family members who will become indemnitors on the bond and will become liable to the bail bondsman for the full amount of the bail that will be payable to the bail bondsman if the defendant skips bail. Now, this guy is surely a flight risk, so you just wonder why a bail bond company will keep issuing bail bonds for him and it leaves you wondering who 
who is paying the 10% premiums for him. But anyway, once the case is concluded and all of the appearances have been made, the court releases responsibility of the bail bondsman by returning the insurance surety bond or guarantee to the bail bondsman. The bail bondsman keeps the non-refundable premium, but he should return any collateral that he collected from the defendant or the indemnitors. So, regarding the 2019 $50,000 bail bond, that bail bond company would have been responsible for the full amount of that surety bond. So that responsibility would not have just disappeared into thin air. They would have had to be responsible for getting that money from somewhere, either coming up with it on their own or getting it from the indemnitors, but they would have been uh, expected to be responsible for that $50,000 responsible to the court up until this present moment in time. Now the bail bond companies have staff whose only job is to call defendants one or more times a week. And they require that the person or the defendant check in in person at least once weekly as well. So I'm very sure because of the serial nature of this individual to jump bail that the warrant would have been issued very soon after the bond was even posted by the bail bondsman. Then he's arrested in Covina, California. Then even though he's nowhere near eligible for bail, George Gascon's office requests bail in the amount of $1,000. There's no record on how he was released, whether he posted a bail bond or not, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was released without having to post any amount of money at all. But if he had the assistance of a bail bond company, he only would have needed to have paid $100. But again, it leaves me asking, who's paying this money? How does a homeless individual have money to pay a bail bond company? And why would a bail bond company keep taking such a risk? But I have heard of bail reform activists who have these funds that they've set up to bail indigent people out of jail. But again, I'll say you just can't play patty cake with criminals because you'll be left responsible when they go out and commit even more horrific crimes. So while I hold this evil criminal 100% responsible for the murder of Brianna Kupfer, I don't see how George Gascon can say that he's not partly responsible. And I don't see how the judge would not be partly responsible. This individual simply was not eligible for bail in my opinion. I just feel that we have to get tough on crime at all levels and have elected officials who are serious about holding the line when it comes to public safety. If we have soft on crime prosecutors, then we have to hope that judges will exercise their discretion in the interest of public safety and allow bail only when the person is eligible to be considered for bail. And bail bond companies have to exercise some responsibility as well. Why are we issuing bail bonds to people who are known flight risk? But what do you think? Do you think any of these individuals in our criminal justice system are also responsible for Brianna Kupfer's murder? The prosecutors, the judges, the bail bond companies? If so, or if not, please leave your comments in the comments section of this video. And until next time, if you've enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up. And please also, subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the bell so you'll be notified whenever I post new videos. And please also follow me on TikTok and Instagram.